The first question, which is I'm going to focus on, and then uh, the, the, second, the second question comes into play. Um, the, do you mind if I ask you your name? Karim. Okay, Karim says that two-state settlement is dead for various reasons. Why not one state? Uh, whether the two-state settlement is dead is a factual question. As it happens factually, the settlements occupy approximately 5% of the West Bank. There's a lot of exaggeration and lack of understanding. Uh, it is true there are about 600,000 or more settlers there. In order to achieve a reasonable settlement, it would require the uh, removal of about 250,000 of those settlers. Otherwise, it's possible for, to have a, uh, an equal, uh, a fair uh, land swap, but 250,000 settlers would probably have to be removed. And there's no question that that's a very tough uh, thing to accomplish. And I don't want to pretend that it's all easy as pie and I have the magic formula, pull out the rabbit from the hat. No, it's going to be tough. But that's not the issue. The issue is, if the two-state settlement is dead, is the one-state settlement alive? So let's look at it. First of all, there's a tendency to see things as, if they are logically, if they are logically sensible, then they must be politically sensible. So let's take something that's logically sensible. There are 30 million Mexicans who live in the United States. Of, of, uh, 30 million Americans who are of Mexican descent. Then there are millions of Mexicans who live here as undocumented workers. Then there's the fact that Mexico's, Mexico's economy each year is dependent about $20 billion in remittances from workers, Mexican workers who are in the United States and send back money to their families in Mexico. Then there's the fact that, well, we stole half of Mexico, including where we are right now. So from a moral point of view, the theft, a practical point of view, the demographic and economic integration of the two places, Mexico and the United States, obviously, obviously, or as Kareem would say, why not just one state between the U.S. and Mexico to solve the whole immigration problem? <laughs> it makes moral sense. It makes practical sense. But as a political matter, it has a snowball's chance in hell of succeeding. So people have to, if you want to address the immigration problem, you have to look for some forms of immigration reform, which, as I said, represent the maximum amount of justice within the circumstances in which we currently live. You can't set up these abstract categories, say it's morally right and even uh, practically sensible if politically there's no possibility. So let's turn to that one state. You say two states are dead, okay? Ask yourself a simple question. It couldn't be more simply put. Which is Israel more likely to do? Is it more likely to give up the settlements or give up its Jewish state? Which is it more likely to do? Give up the settlements or give up the Jewish state? Now you, say, now you say two states is dead because of the settlements. I recognize the settlements are a big obstacle. At least 250,000 settlers would have to be removed by the best estimates that I've read by people whose judgment I trust. Um, but if that's impossible, according to you, then one state is many times more impossible then all you're saying is no solution is possible. And you're dooming the Palestinians to a damned life. I'm not ready to do that. I'm not prepared to do that. Yes, it's true. Two states is a tough uphill battle. No question about it. But one state 
is just jumping over the precipice. There's nothing there. Ask yourself that question. We're talking about politics. Not what's right, not what's practical. Let's ask, we're talking about politics. Is there one state, there are 190 and more states in the world, is there one state, one, that supports one state in Israel, Palestine? Iran does not. Iran is among those 160 countries which each year votes for two states in the UN. Is there one state? No. Take the leftist most political movements. Corbyn, the UK, Sanders here. Do they support one state? No. You're putting forth a formula that has, it's easy to calculate. It has zero support in the world. Zero. Zero support. Is that politics or is that a cult? A cult says to hell with reality. I read a leader of the BDS movement. He's recognized as the leader of the BDS movement. And he writes on a website, he says, Israel is facing imminent collapse. Does that have any correspondence with the real world? That BDS has brought Israel to the point that it's facing imminent collapse. Israel, whether you like it or not, it now has one of the most thriving economies in the world. Imminent collapse? This is fantasy. It has no connection with reality. It was just like in my day when we talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat and armed struggle in the middle of Brooklyn. You know, I, I can't go there. Zionism by definition, is a racist ideology. And like apartheid of South Africa was a racist ideology, it has to collapse, and it did collapse. We have been living as a Palestinians in one state since 1948. We've been discriminated against since 1948. What we are calling for right now is the end of Zionism, where we can all live together, democratic, secular state. It's not, too, it's not too complicated. It's legal. What I'm talking about is legal. On the ground right now, people migrate. On the ground right now, people migrate for one reason or another. Mexican to the USA. The Jews move to Palestine for one reason or another. The Zionists contribute to the to the immigration of the Jews to Palestine. We have to reconcile. I'm not going to carry the burden of the of the past. We have to care. We have to reconcile. We have to move forward and establish. You know, the question. you know what troubles Just, uh, me? What you know it? the expression deja vu? You've heard it before. It's not deja vu. Yes, it is, it's because not, George certainly goes back far enough to remember the PLO charter from 1969 upwards was advocating one state, one democratic state. The same slogans, the same complete disconnection from reality. Finally, the Palestinians recognized, well, it's an impossible battle. And so they then revised their goal. And now all these people are coming along and they, they're reinventing the wheel. They're talking as if this slogan is new. One state, one democratic state. How many people in this room who are Palestinian or Arab who go back to the 1970s don't remember that slogan? Who doesn't remember it? Who remembers it? Raise your hand. Raise it up high. High, high, high. Don't be so embarrassed. Is this new? Is this a revelation that somehow it never occurred to anyone until BDS came along for one state? Hasn't this been argued and debated now for 50 years? And now you want to start up with it again? And it's logical and it's perfectly sensible. I got news for you. The United States, excuse me, the world is a tiny pebble spinning in the universe. Does, do states make sense? Do 190 fragments in this tiny pebble, do they make any sense? But is there anybody in this room who thinks it's a 
feasible, practical solution now to advocate the abolition of all states? Is that reasonable? Is it practical? I don't understand what's happening here. People are losing all sense, all political sense, and advocating things that have no possibility whatsoever of doing anything to help people who are suffering terribly. And it's really morally offensive to be advocating these things from beautiful San Diego. There is something really wrong with that. Kids are being poisoned before our eyes. And you're talking about slogans that have nothing whatsoever to do with reality. That's just flat out wrong. In your opinion, because you're, so what is the most practical, effective, methodical way the Palestinian can resist the occupation? Okay, and that's a good way to end, and it was the second question I wanted to address, which is the situation now in Gaza and the, uh, uh, the campaign that's begun, uh, began on March 30th, and it's gonna go on for the next six weeks. Um, when I was a Maoist, obviously I made a lot of mistakes, but there were a lot of things that Mao Zedong said which made perfect sense. He was a very smart guy, obviously a shrewd political analyst and shrewd military analyst. Uh, and he said, the object of politics is to unite the many to defeat the few. You have to create as big a coalition as possible to isolate your enemy. And then if you want to isolate your enemy, you have to look at the place where they're weakest what you might call the line of least resistance. Where is Israel weakest right now? Well, it's very weak on the question of the blockade of Gaza, the siege of Gaza. Uh, international law is totally against it. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, International Committee of the Red Cross, everyone has said the blockade is illegal under international law. It constitutes a form of collective punishment. They're very weak on the, on the, on the blockade, and it also happens to be the blockade is the major cause of the misery that the Palestinians have endured for the last 11 years. So sensibly, you carry out a campaign of mass nonviolent resistance, which they're doing now, and you have to focus on the demand where Israel is going to be most isolated and most likely to have to succumb to international pressure as the, as the uh, killings continue as gradually the cameras shift to what Israel is doing, um, they will come under a lot of pressure on the question of that blockade, that siege. You know, the kids can hold up signs, we're being poisoned to death, which is literally true. The blockade has to be lifted immediately and unconditionally, that's what the UN Human Rights Council said. The blockade is illegal, that's what Amnesty said, that's what Human Rights Watch said. We have here, here, we have a campaign which we as supporters, we have a real chance of reaching a public. We have a real chance, a million children who are being poisoned. That's, a, that's something that can reach a public, you know. So I totally support the nonviolent civil resistance. But you have to remember nonviolent civil resistance in order to be effective, it has two parts. The public has to see the means as legitimate, and of course they see nonviolent mass resistance as legitimate, but they also have to see the goal as legitimate. That's perfectly obvious, everybody understands that. If you, for example, if you support the right of abortion and a thousand uh, what are called um, uh, uh, supporters of right to life, they surround abortion clinic and they say, uh, we're going to go on a hunger strike until this abortion clinic closes down. If you're a supporter of abortion, you can say, I don't care if you drop dead, you know, because I support it. You have to set an objective and a goal that's also supported by the public. You can reach the public now on the question of ending the siege and ending the blockade. Is it, re is it a realistic expectation that you can reach a broad public now 
on six million Palestinian refugees returning to Israel. Is it realistic? You can reach a broad public? No. Any sensible person knows that Netanyahu will get on and say, what do you expect us to do? They want six million refugees to flood our country. We're only six million Jews here. And now they want to bring in six or seven million refugees. He'll claim the right of self-defense, and the whole international community will support him. But if you say we want to lift that siege, that illegal, immoral, criminal siege, you have a possibility. Now, unfortunately, the leadership right now has decided not to focus on the siege and has instead decided to focus on the right of return. And I think that's a complete disaster because you can't get public opinion behind it. You can't reach people, even if it's legally their right to return and it's morally their right to return. There is that political fact. Politically, it won't fly. Anybody who has contact with anyone outside their tiny little cocoon knows it won't work. And so it has to be communicated to those people. So many kids are going to die in the next six weeks. At least set a goal that will redeem that death and not for it to be wasted like the 350 kids who were killed during Operation Cast Lead, the 550 kids who were killed through protect, and during Protective Edge, another bloodletting, another bloodletting for a goal that's completely, totally beyond reach in our country at this time or in Europe at this time. It's very painful, very frustrating to observe. Thank you.